Thank you to Twitch for sponsoring today's video. Unless you've been living under a rock for a very long time, Twitch is a live streaming interactive platform where you can get a deeper experience with all of the games that you love and enjoy playing, as well as of course watching. You can connect with other creators, like-minded players, and just people that you want that awesome sense of community with. You can see all types of streamers on Twitch. Maybe you're like me and you always want to get better at League of Legends and see how you can improve, and no other place has more high-ranked and high-elo players than Twitch. You can tune into any Grandmaster or Challenger stream and learn so much from seeing how they play. With the new League of Legends season just starting in the last couple of days, there's no better time than right now to start learning how to improve and watch streamers on Twitch. Maybe instead you're more like someone who wants to be entertained for hours and hours, and you can look no further than my my favorite streamer, which is Tyler1. Tyler is not just a league player, but also a hilarious personality and a genuinely awesome and humble person if you ever get the chance to meet him at an event like TwitchCon, which is where you can meet up with your favorite streamers every single year. The best part about Twitch is that you never know what kind of moment you'll come across while watching. The sense that one of the funniest, coolest, and most amazing moments in gaming is right around the corner, that's an awesome feeling. At this point, if you weren't already interested in watching gaming streams on Twitch, you definitely should be now. So click that link in the description down below, and big thank you one more time to Twitch for sponsoring this video. In order to release a champion, it's not a simple process, at least not by modern standards. Sure, Riot used to release a new champion for us every two weeks, but that's because at the time they had a ridiculous amount of employees and resources dedicated to filling the game up with new champs. At the time, that was the main focus for their development. Even still, in the early days of League, with all of the inexperience of the developers, technical limitations, budget limitations, and less overall players to please, making champions back then compared to today was still much easier. It was just a simpler time. Nowadays, well, they have not only the champion's gameplay to make, but also extremely high quality splash arts, animations, visual effects, textures, login screens, events bundled in with champion releases, dedicated music, the list goes on and on, but more often than not, it feels like they get it done. Champions that they begin working on do make it into the final product. As promised back in early 2019, we would get two new types of marksman style champions that they said they were working on. One of them designed for support, and the other designed around the usage of multiple weapons. And this year they delivered on their promise, seemingly right on time. But what if I told you? There is a champion who was almost never released. An extremely important champion in League of Legends right now, even more so at the highest level, but one that would go through not only one, but two different cancellations. A champion that was put on hold twice because of technical limitations, lack of resources, and lack of time. And then, after the champion was released, it didn't get any better. In fact, it got worse. It was an absolute nightmare, a buggy, unplayable mess of a champion, with more changes and updates after their release than any other champion in the game's history. By far, he has the most disastrous, ridiculous, and painful release of a champion that we've ever seen, and a history that is plagued with enthusiasts begging to fix their beloved champion. Despite all of this, his importance to the game is nearly unmatched. And it kind of reminds me of a quote by Hunter S. Thompson. Life's journey is not to arrive at the grave safely, in a well-preserved body, but rather to skid in sideways, totally worn out, shouting, holy shit, what a ride. And you know what? That's pretty accurate, because this is the ridiculously painful, yet interesting and unique story of League of Legends Emperor of Shirima named Azir. If you know anything about League of Legends history, you might think that today's story is going to begin with this picture. This was a champion named Seth, the Sand Mage, and he was a mage that was designed to use, um, <laughs> sand. And as you can probably tell, he looks pretty similar to the final product that we were given with Azir. 
But this is actually not where our story begins, but rather all the way back when League of Legends was just a very small seedling for its otherwise global tree that it's become now. Back in 2009, we would see the alpha stage, the beta release, and the final product later that year of a small indie game known as League of Legends Clash of Fates. And of the original design champions, there are some classics that have been around since day one. Twisted Fate, Anivia, Annie, Amumu, and Teemo, all recognizable champions. But of those original champions, they were not the only ones that Riot had in design, as there were quite a few that would end up being cancelled, for various reasons. One of those cancelled champions was called Well, the Hydrasoul. He was this water mage, not really like a Nami or a Fizz, but more of a true water bending champion, and he could use water to create waves, tsunamis, maybe alter the terrain, and move it around as he pleased. Players were able to uncover parts of his kit by looking into hidden beta files, parts of the game that didn't exist yet but was still hidden in the code. This guy had an extremely cool concept and was by far the most complex champion that was going to be released in the original first batches of champions. And that was exactly the problem. Riot was not able to create his kit the way that they wanted and to a quality that was appropriate for the game because they genuinely lacked the technical ability to do so. It's unfortunate for sure, but in any game's infancy, not just League of Legends, these kinds of things are probably bound to happen. You won't always be able to execute on every single cool idea that every single cool developer has pop into their head. Sometimes there are just some serious problems that you have to learn to overcome and figure figure out in the development process. As disappointing as this really was, Riot would actually have another shot a couple of years later when taking the Hydra Soul out of the icebox. That is the part of the development process that freezes production and will put a project on hold, that way you can begin to tackle it at a later date. This time, this champion concept was reborn, known as Seth. Seth would be more similar to the previous version than Azir would ever be. He was most likely almost the exact same champion, but rather than using water, he would instead use sand. There was a leaked look at his ultimate ability that gives you a pretty cool idea of what he was supposed to do. He could grab these two sand hands, move them around. It looks super cool and really unique in this game. No other champion can really do this. But Riot would go even further with Seth and take an idea from another game, which was StarCraft. In StarCraft, Zerg can transform the map by spreading creep, and doing so throughout a whole match could sometimes even cover half the map or more in creep. Seth would be able to spread sand on Summoner's Rift, and doing so would change the way that the map interacted. For example, if Seth would cast his abilities on sand, they would get some kind of additional effect, like CC or increased damage or duration and this idea would be used a little bit later on in Talia's Worked Ground. This kind of map minigame is something that would also be used later on in Skarner's rework during the Juggernaut update, as he can capture the spires and he will be stronger if he's able to fight on them. However, in general, this mechanic is not really liked that much or well received by the community. The first time around, technical problems would plague the development of Well, and for Seth, it turns out the exact same thing would strike once again. But this time, it wasn't on Riot's end, but instead thinking about their consumers. Players with low-end PCs would have struggled immensely to run the game correctly, far more than any other champion's abilities would put much more strain on any type of computer, and it would have negatively impacted a lot of the player base because at the time it was more common that people played on lower-end PCs. League of Legends has always prided itself on being a very accessible game. It's a free-to-play model with little to no pay-to-win at all. The game is basically entirely cosmetic microtransactions, aside from these experience boosts, which generally don't really affect the gameplay at all, and it runs so well on even a very low-end PC. It was simply against the interest of their player base and against the interest of their business model to ever release something that, at bare minimum, required an average to good computer setup. Most people back then, and sometimes even now, played this game on their $200 Walmart laptop that their dad gave them which he got from the dumpster retrieval at work. 
So, just like the first version, Seth would end up being cancelled. And this of course probably was a huge blow to Riot, with their team working on two separate champions, both of them feeling like their work was a total waste, and you don't really want that. So once again, Riot would icebox the design, and in 2014, they would try it one more time. This time, for real. This way, they were not going to have a third cancel. We're getting this champion one way or another. And that's exactly what would happen. They would keep a very similar artistic style for the champion model and keep the sand theme, but swap out the actual sand for sand soldiers. Azir would come out to return Shirima to its former glory after it fell, and their emperor was born anew. On September 6, 2014, this damn near unplayable piece of crap would come out and everyone would witness. There are League of Legends champions with bugs. The game is far, far from flawless in its gameplay, but for the most part, it actually does run pretty well. Considering how many games of League of Legends are played each day, each week, each month, each year, you honestly might expect even more bugs to happen. But Azir was not just a little buggy, he was more like infested with them. The number of bug fixes this champion has received approaches disgusting levels. This is a clip from a pro guides video that I helped produce where we talked about how many patches this guy needed after his release. The actual severity of how many bugs he had was not a joke. Let's take a look at this list. Patch 4.18, two weeks after his release. Passive, fixed a bug where two Azirs could each summon a sun disc from the same interactive clicker. Fixed a bug where some champions could use abilities on the interactive clickers. Q, fixed a bug where conquering sands would make sand soldier attacks deal no damage. Fixed a bug where sand soldiers would fail to pass through a wall if the dash range was too short. W, fixed a bug where multiple soldiers attacking multiple targets would incorrectly apply reduced damage. Fixed a bug where dancing would break the soldiers' basic attacks. E, Azir now follows his sand soldiers if they are currently moving via conquering sands. Fixed a bug where Azir would dash to the wrong soldier in certain situations. Fixed a bug where using shifting sands right after a rise would not work. R, tons of bug fixes so it will now no longer deal damage multiple times, multi-bounce, pin targets to walls, fail to bounce targets to the far side of the wall, not break channels, break spell shields, and still knock enemies back. Oh, Oh wait, you think we're done with his R, huh? <laughs> Remember that this is just the first patch after his release. How about the next patch, 4.19? R, fixed a number of bugs around detecting enemies that are behind Azir at cast time. Fixed a number of double bounce bugs. Fixed a number of bugs that allowed enemies to dash through the wall if they timed their dash correctly. Oh baby, we're not done yet. Patch 4.21, three of his abilities all receive more bug fixes. Patch 5.1, his W received a bug fix. Patch 5.4, his passive got a bug fix. 5.16, two more abilities, multiple bug fixes each. 517, more bug fixes. 5.22, more bug fixes. And 5.24, to finish off 2015, what do we get? Well, of course, more Azir fixes. One of his more famous bugs at the time was this hilarious issue with Jace's E, Acceleration Gate, where the Azir would play against Jace, and because the gate was coded in-game like an invisible line of minions, which is actually pretty normal for this game, for some reason, Azir could interact with it, and dealing any accidental damage to the gate would result in Azir getting a ton of experience for free. There would be clips of Azir where he was level 12 or 13, when everyone else in the game was around level 7 or level 8. Oh yeah, and there, there was one more, wasn't there? What was it? What was it? The, the passive? The towers, the towers, the towers, right? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, I remember this one. Huh. It's safe to say, for months after his release, the champion was undoubtedly disliked by the pros. But this was the end of the season anyway, and he wasn't even available for play at the end of Season 4 for the World Championships because he was so buggy, Riot just said, no, you're not allowed to play the champion. Which would buy them some time to actually make the champion work. And this, specifically, would impact the rest of that entire season and the year after that. The Emperor would get his shot come 2015, and after all of those fixes, he would rise up to be one of the best champions that we have ever seen. You would only need one word to describe 2015 Azir, which is dominant. I belong, I belong to you.
of SKT. That last outer tier turret goes down, and they now have their eyes only set on the base. He had finds him off the wall. He can't get through the gate. He went into the wall. But even though he didn't, every flash on people that escaped was burned. And they want Phoenix in this turret. Oh boy. He's pretty strong though. What's he gonna do? Oh! Oh, oh he got two! He's gonna get a triple Phoenix. kill! A quadra kill! An amazing wow. play by Phoenix on his ear! The legacy of Sharima is real! This champion did literally everything. He had the best laning phase in the game for mid lane. He had the best scaling in the game for mid lane. He had utility on his slow with Q. He had range with his soldiers. He had wave clear, burst damage, DPS, crowd control with his R and E knockup, mobility with his E, a shield on his E, disengage with R, hard engage with R, tower sieging on his W, tower defense on his passive, zone control, and 1v1 potential. He was the Michael Jordan of League of Legends champion and he did it all. This is a power graph relative to game time. This showcases champion power curves throughout a game. Jinx is what we call a hypercarry champion, a champion who might be a trash can early, but scales to be a total monster that can easily solo carry once reaching max items. These types of power curves are pretty standard. Early game champions are of course strong early, but then fall off late. Some champions are strong early, like Caitlyn, but then weaker in middle parts of the game, but then can get strong again once they hit late game. Ideally, every single champion design should have some point where they can be in this zone and be really, really strong, and have points where they can also be in this zone, where they are really weak. This gives them a fair and balanced gameplay pattern, something to exploit against them, and something to use to your advantage while you play as them. But Azir's, <laughs> Azir's, honestly looked something like this. The champion was never weak. He was like Draven in lane, but Vagar late game. Sound broken? Well, yeah, he was. Azir's professional play numbers in 2015 looked like this. He had 537 bans, 409 picks, with a 53.7% presence, and an overall win rate of 208 and 201. This made him the second most banned champion in pro play for the entire year, only trailing Kalista. 2016 would be more of the same, despite receiving a lot, and I mean a lot, of nerfs. He would once again have 400 plus bans and right around 400 picks. With a 39% presence, his overall win rate was 200 wins and 191 losses. If you total the number of games picked and banned by Azir for two straight seasons, Season 5 and Season 6, 2015 and 2016, he stands above the rest. No other champion in a two-year time period has ever been picked as much as Azir. One of the more interesting parts of the champion is that in spite of all of this success at the competitive level, his solo queue win rates were never good. Not even a little bit. Azir has always been regarded as one of the hardest, if not the hardest champions in the game to learn and master. And this is in large part due to his micromanagement of the soldiers. On top of that, I think in this lol class guide by Bjergsen, he notes pretty well why the champion doesn't do well in solo queue. I will be paraphrasing his thoughts. Azir outplays you by pushing you in, by getting your tower, zoning you off CS, and then scaling into the late game by outputting a lot of DPS. This is not the same level of flashy 1v1s that we so often see in solo queue, and lower elo players have no idea and no concept of how to beat their opponents in a war of attrition. Azir beats you because he wins slowly, consistently, and in calculated little plays. Not by roaming bot lane and getting a double or triple kill on Katarina. This playstyle is not only the best for solo queue, but even if it wasn't, most players wouldn't be good enough anyway to use the full strengths of Azir and use the full strengths of the champion to their advantage. A 20 CS lead in Challenger means a lot more than a 20 CS lead in Gold, and that's why you don't really see him. Because of these massive, glaring gameplay problems, Azir would be lined up for a mini rework in 2017. This would target his very strong power curve, range advantage, and of course burst damage, but really trying to nail the theme of soldier control and make that his main focus. 
The 2017 mini rework was really the year where Azir would receive almost a total overhaul of his kit, in hopes that they wouldn't struggle for years and years to get the champion where they wanted him. To start off, even before he was truly reworked, there were massive quality of life changes everywhere. If you played Azir in 2015, you will remember how hard it was to do the Sharima Shuffle. It wasn't that we were just all bad, though that's part of it, but doing your combo was clunkier, less consistent, and the dash doesn't even work the way that it does now. In late 2015 and early 2016, Azir got a really nice change that made it so the dash will always follow your Q until the end, rather than stopping where the Q used to be. This this would mean that Azir could start drifting all over the rift and pull off a lot of nice plays that were not possible before. He would also have some cleaned up animations, auto attacks, and of course more bug fixes. These little changes were minor but very important because the mini rework itself would show the community a new side to Azir, one that felt more playable for the average mortal person. These changes would gut his range, his burst damage, and his laning phase, but made it so the soldier auto attacks were now the complete focus of his kit and the complete focus of his damage. Azir would end up being given two new mechanics. Firstly, whenever he has three soldiers out, he gains a huge buff to his attack speed, and more CDR focus builds allowed for nearly permanent uptime come late game. As long as you got your three soldiers out there, you were god mode for a few seconds. This is still in his kit today, and is one of the better changes they've ever given to a champion. As an Azir player, this feels really good, because you know your window in which you become more powerful, and the enemy also has a clear window to know when they should be backing off. His E was then given a total makeover. The old shield used to last for a whopping 4 seconds, but the only way that you could get the shield is if you dashed right into an enemy champion and hit them. This was cool, but very hard to execute and utilize properly. Instead, he now no longer knocks up enemies with the dash, but he always gains the shield instantly. This type of change is what we call a shift in power budget, because the shield now lasts for less than half the time, but the fact that it's much more reliable is a huge deal. It's more useful throughout the course of an entire game, rather than in one or two specific scenarios. The question would then be, how would these changes affect his solo queue win rate in 2017? Would he finally get out of the 40%? Could he maybe come anywhere near a 50% win rate? Well, yeah, he actually did. Instantly, Azir's win rate would reach an all-time high for him after his mini rework. In fact, if you look, the only times Azir has ever had above a 50% win rate in solo queue during his entire history were a few times during that year. During no other year did he ever pass the 50% win rate barrier. This spike in his win rate had players questioning whether or not us mere mortals could finally play him. Maybe average Joes and Timmies down the street could finally play him to a decent level. And it turns out, yeah, they could. Because they did lower the skill required to play him, but it was also discovered that the champion was just stupid OP, which was most of the reason that he was able to hold that win rate. Again, Azir would go through another round of nerfs, then more nerfs, and more nerfs. And somewhat surprisingly, there really isn't much left for his timeline until present day. Azir's been in a little bit of a downturn the last two years. He really hasn't been relevant for a little while. However, it appears that things might be turning around pretty soon. To start this season off, Azir was featured by Riot in two different ways. Number one, he was directly buffed right now on this patch, helping out his art to be a little bit more impactful. And he was also seen in their teasers for this season, indicating that yeah, they haven't forgot about him. They note in the patch that he didn't have a very high presence in pro play last season, so they are looking to slowly but carefully buff him. This to me seems like a fine approach, but if I were them, I would be very careful, because I do think right now he seems like he's in a very solid and balanced spot. Despite the fact that he's receiving this buff, he might not need it. The new Conqueror changes were excellent for his ear. This is almost exactly the rune that he was looking for. A well-known NA streamer by the name of Full Sand took to smurfing this preseason and even built suboptimally by trying out Smite, Rod of Ages, and Archangels a few games, and was still able to rack up a 43-0, 100% win rate, taking Conquer every single game. If you take a closer look at his games, it feels like Azir might be pretty strong, yet pretty underappreciated right now. He may, may even be OP, but we won't know for sure until the season starts and players like this actually play in their real elo. 
Azir is not at all the champion that we thought we would get, or probably what Riot thought they would ever have to make. Azir was supposed to be a water mage, one that used waves and tsunamis to drown his opponents. Azir was supposed to be a sand mage, building hands out of the sand to clap together his opponents and spread the desert all throughout the rift, changing and terraforming the map to his liking. And when both of these ideas fell through, Azir's third iteration would be the one that we got, but not the one without flaws either. On top of his incredibly buggy history, he's also had countless mechanics removed from his kit. He used to be able to sacrifice his soldiers to enemy turrets, chunking them for some health. He used to have much higher range on his soldiers and their dashes. He used to knock enemies up with his E, and his R used to be more like a bounce house, and it used to deny and stop enemy dashes kinda like a poppy W, but in wall form. From his first original concept to his current kit, you might be hard pressed to find another champion that has had this many problems, this many different versions, and this many bug fixes and quality of life updates. Well, um, except for maybe one other champion. But his documentary will have to come out at a later date. Even if Azir is not perfect, his importance in this game is nearly unmatched. There are very few champions with as cool of a lore, theme, ultimate, and competitive play excitement as Azir. And that's what makes players love to hate him and hate to love him. I just hope for the Azir player's sake he can eventually get all of those bugs fixed up and they can start to love their main champion once again. And I also hope for your sake that you enjoyed watching this video. Thank you very much, and I will see you all next time.